What's up everyone, Carlos here with another video talking about Prey. This video will cover a few more topics from recent interviews. The first one gives us a deeper look into the costume design, then an easter egg left for native viewers of the movie, and the possibility for a third movie in the Aliens vs Predator film franchise. Alright, here we go. The first interview is with Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr. It's posted on IndieWire.com. They run the special effects company ADI, which has been known to work with a lot of Alien and Predator films. The past versions of Predators have been pretty bulky and wore a lot of armor, whereas Feral has been designed to be more leaner, wear less armor, and combines his current tech with bones. They first talk about the horror aspect of the Predator in this film. Here's what Alec Gillis had to say. Dan brought parameters of likes and dislikes, and initially, one of the notes said that he wanted this predator to elicit more horror. So that got us talking about whether or not this could have been the origins of demonic spirits in the eyes of the native people, such as the Wendigo, that influenced our thinking. Before they settled on this current design, they experimented with a Neanderthal-style design, which proved too clunky and inelegant so they continued to use the current iteration they came up with. One of the issues Dan had about the original Predator design was that it wasn't anatomically correct. In his opinion, the top portion of the body was too heavy while carrying a large head. They took that into consideration when creating their own version of a Predator. The end result was the most proportionally balanced looking creature, but it still took them a while to get it right. Dan wanted this predator to be the thinnest it's ever been. Tom Woodruff added this comment. We were quick to see that wasn't going to work after putting a guy in a leotard that had been printed with predator flesh so it looked super skinny. The skull mask was the centerpiece, the trophy of a kill that the predator proudly displayed. It connects with the indigenous people and how they hunt animals and use every part of its body in some way, and now, it connects with the French fur trappers, how they hunt buffalo mainly for its fur. Alec Gillis added this statement about the feral predator's skull mask. The idea was that he found some alien and he hollowed out his head, added the tech bits that control his laser sight and heat vision. The director said before that he wanted to remove the plasma caster, also known as the shoulder cannon, because it was way too powerful to use on the Comanche prey it encountered at that time. Alec Gillis says this about this topic. It wouldn't be a fair fight. He did have the fleshets, the little floating landmines, which were intended to be little shrapnel bursts and were a precursor to his nuclear bomb on the wrist. The design process was a great chance for them to bend the rules and change things up. It gave the Predator more of the elements in which he plays a cat and mouse game with Naru. Creating and building the Predator costume started with a clay sculpture over a body cast of the actor. It's then followed by a negative mold of that. That's what they run the foam rubber into, and then we seam and patch and paint, and then ultimately we end up with a tailored costume. They also have to consider the accoutrements, like a loin cloth that was cut out of foam latex, some pouches, and a sculpted piece that looked like degraded metal that sat on the bottom of the ocean for a few hundred years. Alec Gillis then talks about how the creature is combining its tech with the bones from the prey it hunted. He says this, and then he had his high-tech pieces, and one of the interesting design elements was that we wanted to keep to the time. When he's messing with gear on his arm, you'll see bone inlay. That's a reflection of the trophies being embedded in the technology. Dane Diliegro, who plays the Predator in Prey, explains what he went through during filming. It moved my head into the neck of this character, essentially putting everything on top of my head. I was looking through two holes in the neck and my face was hidden, while still giving me the vision required to navigate the best I could during all the acting and stunt scenes. It was form and function working in synergy with this character. He also says what it was like for him going up against Naru, who plays the underdog of the movie. Dane said this, He's in it for the hunt. He's in it for the competition. It's no secret that he's a giant, muscular, athletic, trained killer. But there's a sense of hubris with him. Lack of refinement. Maybe he's younger. I don't know. It's a game. 
It's about outsmarting him. Another article, which is posted on two sites, like thegoldennews.ca and inverse.com, has two unique topics about the movie. The stars had to go through a four-week training camp, where they learned about weapons training in Comanche archery, spears, and knives, while Amber Midthunder had the tomahawk. It was important for everyone to be as precise in the representation of Comanche warfare as possible. But here's the different thing about this training camp. They had to learn a hybrid sign language created just for this film. Amber goes on to say this, We created a sign language. We used real Comanche sign language and also developed our own for the film. Producer Jane Myers would say this about this topic. We created a native tactical sign language with Kevin. Even in his spare time, the cast, they would go down to the river and use it to talk to each other. They became competent. That gave it a lot of authenticity. We don't have many written records of how they operated at the time. So we rely on his survival instincts and knowing what he knows about war and culture. That inspired the way the characters united with each other. Another topic is something similar between Prey and the first Predator movie. When Dutch completed his trap in his area of the jungle, he would yell out into the night, which is a way of calling for the jungle hunter, kind of like luring it to his location where he has traps set up. Naru does something almost the same in the Prey movie. After she captures Big Beard, you can hear Naru whistling. When asked about this scene, Jane Myers said this, I wanted to leave some native things that would appeal to natives and not all. We don't whistle at night because they tell you it calls the spirits. She says, I don't even care. She has that French trapper as bait saying, I'm going to kill you. She just saw her brother get killed, so she goes all out. She whistles at night. The natives are like, whoa, because that means that she is calling him and behold, he comes. This is considered to be a cultural Easter egg for her and the native audiences. In Comanche tradition, it's forbidden to whistle at night. They believe it can call forth spirits. And in this case, the predator becomes that spirit, at least symbolically. Something else that I noticed in this movie is that this predator does not hang the bodies of its victims. We've seen other predators do this in other stories. Of course, not all of them get to display this act. But for a film, it was different to not see this one do it at all. Perhaps it's not part of its culture to hang the bodies, or maybe they just don't have any interest in this act at all. I'm not sure. I mean, we saw the skin snake on the ground, but its bones were left on the tree branch above. Perhaps this predator or its culture care more about just the bones. Another article, which is posted on comicbook.com, has two key topics that I want to point out. The first one is how little input the studio had with the movie. Alec Gillis says this, It's always a partnership with the filmmakers, and in this case, this felt more like an old school film, despite being a studio film. This feels like a Fox movie, like a great old school Fox movie. This was Dan Trackenberg's vision, and we got to work directly with him without it running through too much studio input. The last part of this article talks about how Aliens vs. Predator could return for another film. Alec Gillis goes on to say this, I think there's certainly some good stories that could be told in that world, and it's not like it hasn't been done. What excites me about Disney's involvement in this is what they've done with the Star Wars universe, where you can have these standalone side story movies. It expands the universe and expands possibilities. So we're looking forward to filling in those spaces with cool creatures, cool stories. And that's it for this video. That wraps up a few more topics with more details. If you want to see more updates on this film's history or backstory, all you have to do is subscribe to my channel. You're also going to see more lore videos very soon. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you on the next hunt.